way. All right. Uh, look there at Genesis chapter 4. We looked at Lamech, how that he took two wives and that he was the first polygamist. We also looked at um, Jubal, who was the father of all such as handled the harp and organ. So we lo- noticed there the music. Uh, then verse 22, and Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Now this is, uh, if Cain shall, verse 24, If Cain shall be avenged seventy-fold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Now this is not clearly stated right here in the Bible, but tradition, now you take or leave it, but Jewish tradition says that that, Verse 23 is the first song in the Bible, that that was actually a song that he sang. And so that would make sense. Uh, But that is the first type of of song mentioned in the Bible there, if that truly is a song. And Jewish tradition tells us that it is. Now, we studied all that about music and all that last week, but I want you to notice in verse 22, we're talking about a man by the name of Tubal Cain. Now, Now, Lamech was a violent man, all right? He said there in verse 23 that he killed a young man uh, to my hurt. So this is might be a case of self-defense. It might be a case of this young man was trying to hurt him or this young man had done something to him and Lamech killed him. And so what you're going to notice throughout the Bible, especially in the first six chapters of Genesis, is there are two lines, all right? Now, we do not believe that Genesis 6, the sons of God, meant the godly line of Seth, right? We don't believe that. We believe those were fallen angels. But there is the truth that down through all the way to Genesis 6, there are two lines of people. There are the sons of Cain and there are the sons of Seth. As a whole, the line of Cain was an ungodly line And as a whole, the line of Seth was a godly line. And these two lines had conflict one with another. Now, ultimately, Noah being from the line of Seth, the Bible says that Noah was what? Perfect in his generations. That means that the line of Seth, he was perfect in his genes. Why would would that terminology be used there? Perfect in his generations, his genes, his DNA. Because those fallen angels had intermarried with humans, with women, right? So as a general rule, the line of Seth was an untainted line. There was no bad DNA mixed in. And as a whole, the line of Cain was tainted, all right? So as a whole, Seth kept themselves pure from intermarrying with the angels, and the line of Cain did not. Now watch this, you ready? The Bible says that Tubal Cain, the Tubal Cain means thou would be brought of Cain. So Tubal Cain means somebody that's brought of Cain. Another uh, translation of Tubal Cain is the arrowhead or the iron arrowhead. Cain was brought forth. He came from an ungodly line. His father was a violent man. He, the first case of self-defense in the Bible, or if you, you know, want to delve in a little bit more of the conspiracy stuff, uh, it's the first case of somebody bragging about murder. Of course, we know Cain, all down through the line of Cain is murderers. Murder is always associated with the line of Cain. So now we have here that Tubal Cain was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. This means that Tubal Cain was more than likely the father of weaponry. He would have been the ones that would have formed arrows, iron arrows, swords. He would have been the one that would have developed armor. You say, did they have all that stuff all the way back there? See, we, we have this in our mind, folks, that when we think about, you know, Cain and Abel, that Cain is out there and he just picks up a rock and hits Abel in the head. Now, maybe that's how it happened. You know, we imagine Abraham and all those guys kind of walking around with, you know, big, you know, cavemen stuff, big billy clubs and just hitting people in the head and all that kind of stuff. But what you have to understand is that pre-flood world was extremely advanced. How many of y'all ever, how many of y'all saw that Hollywood movie, Noah? Did y'all ever see that with Russell Crowe in it? All right. It's a decent-ish movie. You know, it's got Hollywood in it, obviously. 
But I remember that when that, when that movie came out, um, there was all these Christians that were going nuts about it in a bad way, saying how biblically inaccurate it was. And they said that one of the things that was biblically inaccurate about it, they said, yeah, they, they, uh, they, they had that, uh, the, the civilization that Noah lived in at the time, they like, they like said that there was like all this technology and all these big cities and these advanced, you know, advanced uh, uh, cities and all this stuff that they had knowledge of. Like, that's so wrong. No, it's very right, actually. In fact, we studied this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this. Our government is actively involved in covering up evidences of advanced technology in ancient times. They're involved in that because what that does is give credence to the Bible. You know that they have found batteries? Batteries. They have hieroglyphics of flying machines. All these tales about Atlantis and all this kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of that is more truth than fiction. These advanced civilizations. I mean, uh, how, the, how, the, the, how did the pyramids get built and all these great feats, how they brought stone over Easter Island. That stone that made those big heads. And by the way, they, they've now figured out that those... Not, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about Easter Island? Yeah. All right, it's an island out off the coast of South America, and there's just these huge granite stone heads. And the rock is not native to the island. That means it was brought from somewhere else. They're huge. But now they've now found out that it's not just heads. They actually dug down. It's actually entire bodies. Huge, uh, huge uh, stone bodies. How did they get there? Y'all have seen, you can watch, pull up on YouTube about the, the, rock, uh, the rock balls down in South America, how that they have these, these round spheres made out of rock, and they're perfect, they, they're, they're, more, uh, they're more rounded than they can, under, they don't know how they got so rounded. They measured them with lasers and all that, and said that they're within like the 99 percentile of being a perfect sphere. How did ancients do that with the chisel and hammer? How many of y'all saw the new Indiana Jones movie, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? All right. I love Indiana Jones. Skulls made entirely out of quartz crystal with no evidence of machinery on them. They can't figure out how they would carve these things without them shattering. I'm reading now, uh, uh, I'm almost done with it, The Travels of Marco Polo, who went all across Asia uh, back in the 12th, uh, 1200s late 1200s, he talks about stuff, technology, that you wouldn't think existed at that time. So understand now, Tubal Cain, he begins to develop weaponry. He develops two things, brass and iron. Interestingly enough, both of these metals are involved with judgment. In fact, brass is, it is symbolized uh, as judgment in the Bible. You look at brass, what did they make the brazen altar out of brass is a type of judgment what was the serpent made out of that moses lifted up in the wilderness brass brass is a type of judgment interestingly enough as well iron has to do with shackles and change uh egypt is called an iron furnace watch this there was no, in the tabernacle there was no brass or iron used in any of the tabernacle at all also, Noah is forbidden to use any brass or iron in building the ark. Watch this. When God said to make an altar out of stone, right? You know what he said? He said, that stone that you make those altar out of, I don't want you to touch them with any instruments of iron. I want you to just take the stone in its natural state. Don't touch the stone with any instrument of iron. Iron and brass. When you look at the image of Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of the image. What does he see? He sees an image made out of gold, brass, iron, silver, right? Clay. 
So that iron and brass in the Bible, when God over there, I'm, I'm just giving you examples in Jeremiah chapter 6, where God says, I tried to get silver out of Israel. He said, I tried, I put you over the bellows and burned. And the way you purify silver is by heating it up, right? Liquefying it, putting it over fire. And so God said, I put you over the bellows. I was trying to get the dross out of you. I was trying to get the impurities out of you, make pure silver out of you. But I found out when we put you in that you were just brass and iron. There was no silver in you. You're reprobate silver. You're fake silver. You're not real. He called them brass and iron. So brass and iron, the law of first mention, all throughout the Bible, they now take a negative connotation. And you could probably run, run a million rabbits with that if you wanted to. But Tubal Cain here. Now also tradition tells us that Tubal Cain became a ruler. He was a forerunner of who? Nimrod. He was a forerunner of Nimrod that he set up a quasi-kingdom that laid the foundation for Nimrod to be able to come in. So notice now in verse number 23, And Lamech said unto his wives, Adea and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Notice verse 24, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Verse 25. And there's probably something in verse 24 that you could dig out. I, I didn't get anything. If some of you Bible scholars got anything on verse 24, feel free to let me know. Verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Now the name Enos means a moral man. So notice, Eve here is thinking that Seth is the replacement for Abel. Cain slew Abel, so God raised up another seed, Seth. This is a great principle here, a great spiritual truth. All throughout the Bible, Satan has tried to stop the promise of the coming Messiah. All throughout the Bible. For example, what did God tell to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, we already said, he said, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed, right? That's the seed of the serpent. So God knew, or excuse me, Satan knew that there was going to come from Eve, from her seed, from her giving birth, that there was going to come a man, a man child that was going to destroy him. So what did he try to do? He tried to beat him to the punch. All right, Cain slew Abel. There you go. It's done. It's over with. But God raised up Seth. How about this one? Uh, you remember in the book of Esther, Haman tried to kill all the Jews, but God raised up who? Esther, Hadassah. How about this one? God, uh, Satan tried to kill all the Jewish males in Exodus chapter number 2, but God raised up who? Moses. All throughout the Bible you see this principle of Satan trying to destroy the seed, but God always raises up. And this is what you've got to understand. The only time the devil's ever going to get any victory over you is if you let him. Because even though the devil may fight, and even though the devil may gain ground in your life, and even though the devil may try to destroy some things in your life, the only way that he can accomplish his task is if you let him. God is always going to be able to raise up seed. There's always going to be a remnant. There's always going to be somebody. So what you have to understand in your life is even when things look dead and even when things look hopeless, God is able to raise somebody, raise something up. He's always able to do the impossible. I know that's some practical. We'll throw in some practical stuff there, amen? He's always able to do things that we never could have thought or comprehended in ways we never could have thought. That's how our God works. He's always able, when things look desperate, God is able to do something. All right, let's continue on looking here at verse 26. So Seth has a seed born to him. Notice this. Let me, let me, let me go, let me, let's take a time out really quick and even go back to this. This just popped in my brain. How about this one? God literally tells Abraham, God, this is a great truth here. God tells Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac and I want you to take him up to the mountain and I want you to kill him. 
Well, what was the problem there? Ishmael had already been born, but God already told Abraham that Ishmael is not the promised seed. Y'all remember us talking about last week about how the, the seed line and how always it was seemed like the elder served the younger and the younger was always seemed to be the chosen one and all that. Y'all remember talking about that? So watch this. So God says, Ishmael's not the seed. Isaac, Isaac's the guy. Isaac's the one. And Abraham says, well, praise the Lord, I've got Isaac now. And God said, yeah, why would you take him up to the mountain and kill him? Lord, don't you know all the struggle and all the complications it took to get him here? And you know, da, 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 da. And God says, all right, kill him. So what does Abraham do? Abraham goes up and takes him up the mountain. But there's, some, there's, a, there's a revelation of truth found in Genesis 22. An amazing truth. It looked like the seed was going to be destroyed. And Abraham, they take they go a three days journey away. There's, there's some good truth there. Three days journey away. And they go to Mount Moriah. And Abraham tells his servants, now watch this. Abraham tells his servants, you stay here. And me and the lad will go yonder to worship. And return again. Now wait a second. Did Abraham know he was going up to that mountain to kill his son? Yeah. But what did he say was going to happen? That me and him are coming back. We find, that that's a little nugget of truth there, that we find later in Hebrews 11 further revealed that Abraham had the faith that if he killed Isaac... God was able to raise him up from the dead again. So what you've got to understand is even when you think that things are absolutely dead, where Satan has just absolutely won the teetotal victory, God is able to raise up those things again. That's why you never give up. That's why you never give up on people. Now, I'm not saying you've got to help people out all the time and they just keep on and on and on. We're not saying we give up. There is, listen, there is no hopeless case. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes that as long he that is joined to the land of the living, there is hope. If you are alive, then you have hope. I, I, always, I, I used to say it all the time. And uh, I just got out of the habit of saying it. But I used to always say, if there's breath in the lungs, there's hope for the soul. If there's breath in the lungs, there's hope for the soul. Don't you ever think that you are beyond hope. You say, well, I just, I've gone too far. I might as well just quit. I might as well just go back to where I was. I might as well just, you know, give up on all my dreams and aspirations. Why? Well, because I've just, it, it's all been too bad. It's all gone too far. It's just, it's all just hopeless. Who told you that? Where'd you get that? Wasn't from the Bible, so it must have been from where? Right. The devil. God is always able to raise up seed again, no matter how destroyed the situation may be. So there's your little hope there, all right? See, I can be I can be. Now notice verse 26. We'll, end, we'll get out of here a little early. We'll end with this. And he called his name Enos, which means a moral man. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, we don't exactly know what this means. We don't exactly know, of course, what is the verse that pops into mind right off the bat? He that shall call, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall what? Be saved. Be saved. This, this phrase, calling upon the name of the Lord, uh, is mentioned four times in the Bible. Three of those times it's talking about being delivered. So you have uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That's talking about the second advent. Then you have it mentioned again over in Acts chapter number 2. Uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Then you have Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But men began to call upon the name of the Lord. I really don't have much to give you on what that may mean. Brother Darren, you got anything on that? Well, it Mm -hmm. That was the ancient Jewish take on it, that it was the beginning of idolatry, that they were calling things by God's name that wasn't God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Uh, that, that's one of the theories. It's also, there's also uh, another theory um, that these men began to profane the name of the Lord. Um, there's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a few things. Rutman's commentary on Genesis covers a few of those theories. But as far as it goes, I have no idea what to tell you on what that means. But I'm glad that what we can say now is that when you do call upon the name of the Lord, there's salvation. Amen. All right, we'll stop right there. We'll pick up next week on Genesis chapter 5, and we will study the image and Adam and all that kind of stuff. And we're almost halfway through our study on Genesis. All right, anybody got any questions, comments, or concerns? All right, let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for this day and for letting us have your word. I pray that you bless us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you are dismissed. I love you. Mm -mm, just the first 12 chapters. Mm, Heather. That's